So let's take a look at the tease of unfathomable sorrow coming from the EV scope backers. Uh, these are people who paid about $3,000 for a telescope that can be sort of matched by something that'll cost uh, about $500. All these haters are only jealous of people who are interested in astronomy and the possibility to see beautiful celestial objects without spending a huge amount of money and time. Uh, I think $3,000 counts as a huge amount of money for most astronomers. Expert training, installation and post-processing. And now about that, let's see what we can do with something that costs less than $1,000. Cool. So as you can see, this is one of the most light polluted areas ever. This thing's going to take a 10 second exposure with the telescope. And the way it's going to do it is it's going to give me a four second countdown. So I've got to be really still when I'm doing this, okay? So that's four, one, two. And the reason I've got to be really still is because any vibration whatsoever will shake the telescope. So it gives it four seconds to sort of stop shaking the telescope. And there we go. That's a 10 second exposure on the Orion Nebula. And that's what it looks like. <laughs> it's just, yeah, not so bad really. Let's see if we can zoom in a bit on that. There you go. The Orion Nebula, 10 seconds off. So that's what you can get out of 20 seconds with and absolutely nothing special set up. Yes, look, the EV scope will work. There's a tiny little camera at the top which is picking up the image from the light from the object we're looking at and it's sending that to a projection device which you're looking through. It's a brand new, never thought of before method of using a long exposure to get a picture. Capable of accumulating light in a unique way so we could finally see those nebulae, those galaxies all in a matter of seconds and directly through its lens. And we no one will ever be able to do that, especially under murky, bad light polluted skies from within a city. Oh, well, I'm sure this is gonna be well received by the EV scope backers. That Thunderfoot video is seriously hilarious. The amount of mistakes, assumptions, and flawed arguments he presents is too funny. I wouldn't worry about him or his followers. Nerd rage looks impressive, but it's really just that, nerd rage. Yes, I'm so dumb I just don't have a clue making so many mistakes it's laughable. Can't name any of course, but there are so many mistakes. I bet he's not even a real scientist. Oh, but it gets better. There's a reply. That hygienically challenged buffoon could use a good hosing down as well. From another EV scope super backer. Again, I'm not really seeing much there in the way of an argument. You know, challenging anything that I actually said. Or coming down. The EV scope will have to prove itself over time. Citizen Scientists Initiative will open doors to far more beginners than pompous boastings while surrounded by a hundred grand in astrophotography equipment arguing about who is the bigger focal point or, you know, or things that actual astronomers might care about. But yeah, if my gear was as overpriced as the EV scope, you know, basically adding a zero onto the price, then yeah, you might pay a hundred grand for this. In reality, in non-massively overpriced EV scope land, everything here, the Sky Cannon, cost about $3,000. The big refractor and the mount, maybe two and a half. The six inch Schmidt and the mount was about a thousand. The eight inch Schmidt I got years ago, second hand. So yeah nowhere near a hundred grand. And of course, barely any of this was touched on in the original video. So I'm not quite sure how you got to boasting about this. Simultaneously, I'm some unwashed buffoon who doesn't know anything about what he's talking about and is a braggart with a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment. Uh, not really. I mean, if I were this braggart that he seems to think that I am, I might've mentioned my most expensive telescope the H-Alpha telescope. It does one thing, it looks at the sun and has made appearances in several of my videos. Why wasn't it mentioned here? Well, there was no point. Well, the video is essentially responding to a massively overpriced, cheap deep sky photographic platform masquerading as some brilliant new way to do astronomy. Yeah, for the large part, I don't emphasize how much the kit costs because that's not the focus of the video. It's about showing what it can do, what it can show you. 
And now, yeah, I can afford to spend thousands of dollars on a telescope to show people, say, for instance, the surface of the sun. And I've got to thank people who support this channel through Patreon for enabling that. It wasn't always that way. I bought my first decent telescope because I got out there and delivered newspapers till I could afford it. Then, and this is legit, I worked at McDonald's till I could afford this thing. And honestly, if I was looking about bragging about anything, it wouldn't be the cost of the kit. It would be the dedication that went into making some of these videos. I mean, most of the time, I just gloss over it because like I was saying, it doesn't greatly matter. But if you wanted to remake just that last video, it would take months. I mean, just take, for instance, the full rotation of Jupiter. It took me half a dozen attempts to actually sort of get on the right page with that each one requiring a whole night of observing, and another day after that to actually process the video to get something sensible out of it. And each one of those was kind of a Hail Mary, because even if the atmosphere was stable at the beginning of the night, you didn't know it was going to be like that for the rest of the night. And watching the movement of Uranus over a night, boom, another night gone and another day for the processing. The transit of Venus, I traveled halfway around the world with a couple of telescopes to record the data and at least another couple of days to process it. The solar flares and prominences, again, that I'd never done anything like this. It took me several days just to work out what the hell I was doing. And once I worked out what I was doing, you had to wait till there were some decent prominences, which could be any time, and you needed several days of continuous good observing to watch the movement of the prominences across the sun. You know, that's ignoring the ones that you can see moving over the period of minutes to hours. And the one that probably takes the biscuit <laughs> for the sheer amount of effort that went into, you know, like a seven second video or something, was the time lapse of the supernova. Each one of those images took the best part of a night to record, most of the time freezing my ass off, fighting off the desire to sleep, because when you're on vacation, it's a complete nightmare. All of the day, you're out in the open under the bright sunlight. So when the sun goes down, you feel you've just got to go to sleep, and it's torment to fight against it. Oh yeah, and while on vacation, fun fact, the telescope cost more than the car. Currently in New York, I'm going to be following the setting sun with my telescope and various other stuff to the Pacific. In the car we have planes, more planes, ah, a camera that's going to be doing the time lapse for us. Oh, one last thing, here's some music. I didn't do all of this simply so a decade or so later I could call bullshit on some scam headline about a, a hundred times better than a classical telescope. But sure, over the years I've acquired quite a lot of telescopes. Now you may have noticed in my last video I didn't actually go out and use them. Why? Because where I currently live is in the middle of a heavily light polluted city with murky skies. Pretty much the worst conditions for deep sky photography. But fine, let's go out and see what these things can actually do under these sorts of skies. So, hopefully, later tonight on that mount there, which I'm going to get driving once I can see some stars, I'm going to do a side by side comparison of all of these telescopes uh, just using a standard digital SLR camera. Um, and see how all of these boys compare. So two things that you sort of care about if you're photographing faint objects. The first most important one is aperture. So in terms of aperture, this one is three and a half inches, three and a half inches, five inches, six inches, seven inches, eight inches. Or in terms of millimeters, it's 90, 90, 125, 150, Oh, cool. Um, 170 or something and 200. So, that, uh, yeah, the square of that basically gives you the light gathering capability of these things. The other thing you care about is the field of view. And for that, the shorter the focal length, the bigger the field of view. So, this thing 
has by way the shortest focal length, it's like half a meter focal length on that, 0.6 meters or something. And that's a refractor, so there's no central obstruction on that. This thing is about 1.2 meters on the focal length, so it's twice the focal length of that thing. Um, and like I said, the Maxitoffs tend to have long focal length, so that's about 1.5 meters, 1.5 on the Schmidt. This thing is a beast. This is the 7-inch uh, Maxitoff, that's about 3 meter focal length on that, and the 8-inch Schmidt is about 2 meters. So in terms of focal length, that's 3 meters, that's 0.6 meters. The focal length of that thing is 5 times the focal length of that thing, which means that's got a nice wide feel to it. This thing is much narrower feel. So, hopefully, if the skies hold, and they're always fairly murky here, so yeah, this is almost as good as it gets. So what do we have? We've got a 3.5 inch mag suit off, which was used for the transit of Venus, and a 5 inch mag suit off, which was used for the 2017 total solar eclipse. The 6 inch Schmidt Cassegrain came with the mount, which was used for mounting all of the telescopes here in turn. And a 7 inch mag suit off, which I recently got because it's coming up to 10 years since I first did the whole rotation of Jupiter over a single night video. Now, why is that significant, I ask? Well, 10 years is about how many Earth years it takes for Jupiter to go around the Sun once. That, and that, it turns out that that's basically the point where Jupiter rises at sunset and sets at sunrise in summertime when you might be on vacation. So basically, I want to revisit the time lapse of Jupiter thing, but with updated kit. And that's why there was a big ass refractor in that last video. Because I want to see what's the best piece of kit for doing this. The 8 inch Schmidt there is the one that I got from working at McDonald's some 30 years ago. And on the back end of all of these, I'm going to have the same digital SLR camera. That's it. No specialized kit at all. Now, it looks like they don't make these cameras anymore. <laughs> They're that old. You know, this is about 10 years old, this thing. The only important feature that you need is the ability to live view the sensor. So, one thing you will absolutely need if you're going to play this game uh, is a camera which is live view. Because otherwise, you've got to focus the stars. And focusing without the live view just takes forever. Oops. So, you need... One of these cameras that allows you to look directly at the sensor. This is a Canon 70D, which is actually pretty decent with this sort of thing. And allows you to get nice focus on the stars. Not far. That's not bad. The flip screen is also immensely helpful. Now, you can pick these things up on eBay for a few hundred dollars. Now, I don't know how these cameras have evolved over the years, but cameras like this are still one of the simplest ways to get into deep sky photography. After this, you need specialized kit. Now, the starting price for that specialized kit is going to be similar, but for this video, I wanted something where all you had to do was push a single button and get a deep sky image at the end of it. There we go. That's the trapezium. That's the heart of the Orion Nebula on a live view through the camera. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to push the button. And you see what I mean? Just touching the telescope just gets it around loads. But I'm just going to hold the button down and see what we get, OK? So I'm going to hold it down for one, two, three, four seconds. And let's see what that looks like. When we take a look at the image. There we go. So that's what four seconds on the Orion Nebula looks like. You start about, just start to see the nebulosity coming out. Now, modern specialized kit is much better. More expensive, you know, big sensor, fairly sensitive and all that sort of thing. But you need a computer to run it. Or if you were really keen, and I might yet do this, you could get the exact same camera as the EV scope. It costs about $200. But of course, you would need a computer to run it. And I just wanted this single push button version. Now, on the digital SLR, you get this thing called film speed, which is basically how sensitive the pixels are to light. The more sensitive are, the noisier they get. 
So the film speed here, the ISO will go up to about 10,000 on this thing. But in this case, I scrolled it all the way down to about 1,600. Then I took a 4, 8, 16, and 32 second exposure. So you can see how the different focal lengths and apertures affect what you'll see. Now, there is nothing fancy with these images. They're just half minute exposures under some of the worst astronomical conditions that you might get. Now, I could have put a light pollution filter in here, which would have improved it some, but I chose not to, for reasons I'll come to later. And also, whilst I was doing all of this, I looked through all of these telescopes to optically compare them. The only one that was conspicuously underpowered was the 3.5 inch Mach shoot off. This really just couldn't hack anything but the brightest deep sky objects. It's actually pretty good for the moon and not so bad for the planet. And of course, it's very cheap and very portable, costing about 200 or so dollars. The 5 inch Mach shoot off is about $370, the 6 inch Schmidt. These are the new prices, by the way, is about $550. The 8 inch Schmidt, if you were to get one new, is about $880 all actually gave fairly comparable views under this sort of sky. Why? With deep sky objects, you're looking at things with a low surface brightness. And if the sky brightness is the same as the brightness of the object that you're looking at, it just washes out completely. All you see is the sky glow. Now, both of the Schmitts were mm, clearly out of collimation. Not terribly so, but enough to look optically worse than the Maxutovs. Basically, with the Maxutovs, you start with the outer focus rings and then you focus them down to dots and you get the diffraction rings around them. That's what good optics should look like. The Schmitz were sort of squashed rings that didn't focus down to dots, or not as nice dots, with no obvious diffraction rings. To my knowledge, and this probably goes back to the sort of general design of the telescopes, the Maxutovs were first introduced in military roles because of their robust nature. But they were, at the time, very expensive to make compared to the Schmitz. Now, things have moved on and they're comparable in price to the Schmitz. The 6 inch Schmitz I got brand new and they had the worst collimation. And I really didn't have time to go through and collimate all the telescopes. The 8 inch Schmitz hasn't been collimated for at least 10 years and was somewhat out of collimation. The 5 and the 7 inch Maxutovs were bought new, have never been collimated and both gave very good optical images. So the 7 inch Mach shoot off here was about $1,300 and the 3.5 inch refractor, which I got a long time ago, cost about $1,500. Now these are beasts at the opposite end of the astronomical spectrum. Both clearly were the best optical performers here. Although optically, the 5 inch Mach shoot off was also very good. Both focused straight down to point stars with diffraction patterns, so a sign of good, well collimated optics. The 3.5 inch refractor here is a triplet, basically a color corrected refractor, which makes it much more expensive. Crazy expensive, but optically beautiful. It also has a very short focal length that means wide field of view. So you get a big area of the sky and you focus all of that light onto the same sized pixels as a long focal length telescope takes all the photons from a smaller area of the sky and focuses them onto the same number of pixels. This makes the short focal length refractor fantastic for big objects, but he's conspicuously bad for planets. They just appear too small. In fact, it has to work super hard to keep up with the 5 inch Maxutov, which is about a quarter of the cost of the refractor. The big Maxutov was optically beautiful, but has a tiny field of view, which means that it kind of misses the mark for deep sky objects, but is fantastic for planets. So how do all of these things compare with, say, the Orion Nebula, one of the biggest, brightest, and most spectacular nebula in the sky? Well, in the first instance, I just set up the mount, and that took about 10 minutes. You basically put a telescope on there, align it with three bright stars, and it will track whatever you tell it to track. Now, for me, I really don't like the fact that once these things are aligned, you can't undo the clutches and point it at whatever you want. They don't have encoders on the axis. That means you've actually got to tell the telescope what you want to go and find, and it'll scroll around and find it for you. Now, I've never been greatly impressed by the menus on any go-to mounts, but I've always been impressed, after they've been aligned, how well they do the tracking. Now, for this test, none of that greatly matters. The only thing that you want the mount to do is to accurately track an object for about 30 seconds, and this mount was great for that. So let's start off with the bottom of the barrel, a $200 telescope, 
and we'll take a look at a 4, an 8, a 16, and a 32 second exposure. Well, okay, you can see some nebulosity by the end there. So let's now replace that with a 5 inch scope, and instantly we're comparable with the EV scope. You know, once you factor in that the EV scope exposure was four times as long as the one that I'm using here. And considering this is under horrendous astronomical conditions without even trying, and I'm getting photographs that are comparable to the EV scope, which costs three times as much, all with a single push of a button. And of course, let's remind ourselves how EV scope markets itself a hundred times more powerful than a classical telescope. Sorry, boys, that's just got scam written all over it in a hundred foot tall letters. And now we have the six, the seven, and the eight inch scope. Cool, so now let's take a look at how this looks through the short focal length wide field refractor. Now here you see that the image murks up due to the sky glow amazingly quickly. But this kind of shows you the limits for the telescope. You will never be able to see nebulosity fainter than the sky glow. Well, not entirely true. If the sky glow is only from sodium streetlights, you can actually filter out a lot of it. But yeah, can't get rid of all of it. And sadly, now many of the streetlights are being replaced with LEDs, and there is no way to filter those out. So I left it in there. So you can see under the skies where you can only see the brightest stars, and a city with light pollution, what you might expect to be able to see. Now, none of this, of course, would matter if you were looking at small, bright objects like planets. There, you really don't care how murky or light polluted it is, as long as the atmosphere is still. In fact, frequently, the best planetary conditions are under a slight fog, because typically, fog only starts to form when the atmosphere is very still. But anyway, Let's do a side-by-side -side comparison of all of these images with no processing, nothing. Just the raw images from the camera, simply push button photography. So in a city, you clearly run into the wall for deep sky objects at about five inches of aperture. Under dark skies though, this would be a very different game. There, aperture would win because the sky won't be a glowy mess after 30 seconds. Now, of course, you can play this exact same game with the EV scope. So this, for instance, was their picture of two minutes on the Orion Nebula, under skies that were clearly better than mine. That's what the EV scope does. Cool, and this is what the Sky Cannon could do with 20 seconds at a dark sky site, just by pushing a single button on a digital SLR. But this highlights another problem with astrophotography, an intrinsic one. This isn't a criticism of the EV scope. You're trying to display on a picture things that vary in brightness by thousands of times. So if you want to show the structure on the faint nebulosity, you tend to burn out the center. And if you want to see the structure on the bright nebulosity, then the faint nebulosity simply appears as black. Now, of course, you can mess around a little with Photoshop. And so I can just simply diddle with the brightness and contrast on this image taken by a 30 second exposure with a five inch telescope. And it goes from this to this. And now let's see how that compares to two minutes on the EV scope under good skies. Capable of accumulating light in a unique way. So we could finally see those nebulae, those galaxies, all in a matter of seconds. And just in case you missed it earlier, all of this was done with a single push of a button. Cool, so I'm out here on another very similar night and I've got a slightly different setup on the telescope this time. I've got a, um, a camera which is a very small sensor. It's meant for planetary photography, which is why you're going to get a terribly small field of view here. But this is just to give you an idea of what this could do. Um, and so at the moment, that's actually the sort of live view from the camera. That's down a quarter second exposure, so if I sort of tap the telescope, you'll see it all shakes around a bit. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is going to check that up to from a quarter of a second to that's a second. And even at that, it's a one and a half second exposure. You're starting to see the nebulosity. So I'm just going to dial down the, the gain a bit. Let's dial down the gain a lot. And now I'm going to dial it up to a three second exposure. There we go. 
So three second exposure, and let's go up for about a 15 second exposure or something. And so you, you can get versions of software like this sort of um, that just roll it in real time. And so you see you get some pretty decent views of the middle of a nebula from a pretty light polluted sky from, you know, this is a, this is the couple of hundred dollar telescope. The camera here is actually moderately expensive, but that's just because it's the planetary camera that I had. Uh, you know, you get things that would do something like this for, you know, probably a hundred bucks or something. Cool. So a big sensor is typically what you want for deep sky and digital SLRs are not a bad way of getting that. For planetary, eh, not so necessary. Now for the mounts with a decent telescope manufacturer, you have an understanding that what you're paying for is gonna be fit for purpose. Historically, I've been super skeptical of these one arm mounts as being way too shaky. But actually, this thing's pretty good, even with a heavy telescope. But even here, when you get into the smart devices, I've had nothing but trouble trying to use it. If I align it from the handset, then it works fine, and it's fit for purpose. But when I try to do it from the app, firstly, it loses the connection with the telescope on a regular basis and won't reconnect, which is simply dumb. And even when it does reconnect, the scope actually thinks that it's tracking one object, while the app thinks that the telescope is pointing at something completely different. And I really don't know what's going wrong there, whether it's getting the GPS and location data from the phone or something, and if that's wrong, well, that throws the whole alignment out or whatever. But I'm far from the only person to have this sort of problem. Also, trying to slew the telescope from the push buttons on the handset is super easy. I have four buttons that I can easily feel in the dark, even when my eye is up to the eyepiece. Trying to do this from a smartphone is almost impossible because you get no tactile feedback from the smartphone. You can't tell when you're pushing the buttons. Unless, of course, you take your eye away from the eyepiece to look at the smartphone, which obviously makes looking through the eyepiece and tracking stuff harder. Put simply, these arcane push button cursors are actually a much better way of controlling the telescope than a smooth featureless screen like this. So where am I going with all of this? Yeah, if it works, it would be nice. The thing is that even if all of this smart stuff is a dead loss, which in this case it kind of is, I don't care because the mount is physically solid and it tracks well. All of that you can do with the handset. You don't need any smart device and it gets the job done. And even if all of it fails, I still have a nice telescope to look through. Problem is, if you have any trouble like this with the EV scope, it's completely useless. Unless the device will auto align, it's a $3,000 paperweight. Now, even though the EV scope is over a year late at the moment, apparently the first deliveries are just about coming through. And <laughs> the first tweets about it are coming through, featuring such great hits as my EV scope won't align. Well, what do I do now? And we're actually getting some pictures from people using their actual EV scopes. Not quite as impressive as the uh, PR shots, featuring uncollimated telescopes. Those star images are meant to be nice point sources. Well, what are you going to do about that now? Also featuring out of focus images, super grainy images, and super over pushed images. Think you might have pushed the contrast on that one up a little high. And none of it seems to quite compare to a sky cannon after 20 seconds of pushing a single button. So much for a hundred times more powerful than a classical telescope. Now, probably the best argument for the EV scope is using it for outreach. But surely if this is the case, you would be better off with two or three telescopes like this from reputable manufacturers where they're almost guaranteed to work rather than buying one EV scope like this. So I hope you found the comparison of the performance of all of these telescopes interesting and how almost always the limiting factor of a telescope isn't actually the telescope itself, but the sky that it's under. Eh, something to maybe take to heart before committing to spending 
a few hundred dollars on a telescope and certainly something to take to heart before spending thousands. And as ever, if you found this video interesting and don't want to miss out on more videos like this, make sure you hit the notification bell and maybe drop a like on this video. And if you really like this video and want to support the sorts of things this channel does, you can always do it directly through Patreon. And I'll leave the links below. And uh, thanks for watching.